know, it's sort of hard to find. It took me a little yeah. while. Yeah. Yeah. The corner. Um, I think we have still have like two more minutes. Two more minutes for people to start. Yeah, yeah. should we give people a chance? Yeah, we'll give people That's a chance. Disappointing. Uh, turn out. <laughs> Why don't you come sit in the front row yeah, so that sure. we feel all together? Hi, I'm Dorothy Wolf. Nice to meet you. I love your event. I think Shayla put her stuff down here, so grab that seat. Where shall I sit? to join us down here? Or are you just using the room? Me? You. <laughs> yes, I'll come closer. Sorry, I was distracted. Good. Good. Absolutely. Come on down. Yeah. I saw uh, Julia Trillo recently. Uh, I just thought I ju saw Julia Trillo recently. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. How do you know her? Um, she was actually, when I was um, doing a, uh, my Clinical fellowship at Stanford. Uh, um, she was one of my Katie. students. Katie, so you. now we're I'm friends, curious. and it's just been you. a real joy to Kate. know her. Wonderful. She's, really yeah, she's a great addition to our firm. We're yeah. very excited about her. Just so smart. And it's also funny you ask I mean, me about Genevieve because I have a daughter named Genevieve who's like, also just very, like me. Like, oh, that's why I did the double take. Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. that's interesting. <laughs> I was supposed to uh, connect with someone who I haven't met yet in oh. person, um, so and so I don't know what she exactly looks like, but I I've seen like a very tiny. Come on now, oh, <laughs> and funny. you do look a little bit like Vivian. So <laughs> funny. Hello, hello, come on down. She <laughs> she just went to um, I think the museum. That's great. <laughs> no. Well, I hope this is not a comment <laughs> for sure. on the interest of law students in homelessness. I think it just uh, there are just so many topics. We we I, I wish we could have just had them all back to back in, instead, but unfortunately, I think it kind of ended up uh, because of the time constraint um, having some time conflicts. It's also hard to when after lunch to get folks. You know, yeah. Yeah. meandering back in, in classrooms. Let's give them a little time. Yeah. We need to get cash. Got your token. I did. <laughs> it was very exciting. No, I was on my way, and I ran into my co-counsel, who I'm not. Hello there. Hi. Uh, it's in our person. Oh, two and a half years. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I haven't seen her in person, so she joined our case. <laughs> hi, <laughs> Shayla Myers. Hi. hi. So nice to meet you. Oh, So, um, and I have to yeah, so I'm just, 
co-sponsored this amazing panel on combating hunger, homelessness, and housing oppression. So it's really great to have you all here. We have amazing panelists that I'm going to introduce, um, and then we're going to jump in into everything. Um, our first panelist is Chris Beck. Um, she is the Chief Legal Officer at Crexy, a marketplace and technology platform that consolidates commercial real estate solutions into a unified ecosystem. Prior to joining Crexy, Chris was the chief legal officer and a member of the executive team at United Capital that oversaw the company the company's sale of Goldman Sachs sale to Goldman Sachs for 750 million. As the chief legal officer, Chris advises the senior team on legal strategies to drive business results in diverse areas, ranging from intellectual property strategies for business platform development to key corporate transactions. Chris started her career in the international law firm O'Melveny and Myers. Her exceptional work as a business leader has been recognized by both of the Los Angeles Business Journal and the Orange County Business Journal. Thank you for being here, Chris. And she's also our lovely moderator as well. <laughs> um, our next our next panelist is Dorothy Wolpert. Dorothy Wolpert is a founding member of the firm. Her practice includes trial experience in corporate infr co copyright, excuse me, infringement, legal malpractice, access plaintiff and defendant, probate matters post-acquisition disputes, entertainment cases, and several presidential cases related to the construction of the Los Angeles subway. She has argued in the Supreme Court of the state of California and before all of the US district courts in the state, as well as the Ninth Circuit. Dorothy has served as a judge, pro tem, mediator, and arbitrator in the Los Angeles Superior Court. And she has arbitrated fee disputes for the LACBA. Thank you for being here, Dorothy. Our next moderator is Shayla Myers. She is an attorney in the Housing and Communities Work Group at the Legal Aid Foundation of, Cal of, sorry, of Los Angeles. At LALFLA, she works on issues related to housing and homelessness with a special focus on the criminalization of homelessness and poverty. Shayla litigates cases in the state and federal court on behalf of low-income tenants, people who are homeless, and community organizations including cases challenging the constitutionality of the city of Los Angeles' practices of sweeping homeless encamp um, um, encampments. Prior to joining the Legal Aid Foundation, she was a Scadden Fellow at the Los Angeles LGBT Center and then an associate at the plaintiff's side civil rights firm. Shayla Cook for the Honorable Sandra Segal Ikuta, Ikuta on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and graduated from UCLA Law School with concentrations in public interest law and policy and critical race studies. Before moving to LA to attend UCLA, she coordinated an advocacy program and hotline for sexual assault survivors in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where she grew up. Oh. And our final panelist um, is Nisha N. Vies. She's a senior attorney with the, Les the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Her work includes providing support to legal support to legal services providers on housing matters, litigation to protect against displacement, and, and advising on housing policies that are of statewide concern. With a background in community law and fair housing, Nisha's advocacy is rooted in the, in the belief that all persons should have access to safe and affordable housing of their choice. Prior to joining the Western Center, Nisha was the directing attorney of Public Council's Homelessness Prevention Law Project 
and responsible for coordinating its direct legal services programs, including evictions, eviction defense and benefits advocacy for people experiencing homelessness and those at imminent risk of homelessness. She also worked with the Public Council's Community Development Project, where her work included providing counsel to community-based organizations, including legal advice and capacity building support to nonprofit, affordable, and supportive housing providers, and affirmatively enforcing laws to ensure all adequate supply of affordable housing and protections against displacement in the region. With two public council colleagues, she was a fellow in the 2017 class of the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Laws Racial Justice Training Institute, a national leadership program that equips anti-poverty advocates to address the role that racism plays in causing and perpetuating poverty. Nisha started her career as a staff attorney and later deputy litigation director with the Southern, Calif Southern Californian Housing Rights Center. There, Nisha represented tenants and homeowners in challenging discriminatory practices on the basis of race, national origin, familial status, sexual orientation, disability, and other protected characteristics in the federal and state courts. In 2010, Nisha was selected as the J.M. Spears Clinical Teaching Fellow by Stanford Law School. As a clinical lecturer and teaching fellow at Stanford's Community Law Clinic, Nisha trained and supervised law students in the representation of low-income clients in a variety of matters, including eviction defense, affirmative hab habitability cases, and administrative hearings before the local housing authority. She also developed curriculum for and led seminars on unlaw unlawful detainer defense, client interviewing and counseling, developing case theory, and cross-cultural awareness. Nisha serves on the board of directors for Hollywood Community Housing Corporation, a nonprofit affordable and supportive housing provider. She is a graduate of UC Berkeley and UCLA School of Law, where she completed the David J. Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy. She recently returned to the law school as a lecturer in law, teaching the problem solving in the public interest seminar and a course on Los Angeles housing law and policy. <laughs> So nice to see so many faces here. I love um, how the community has really come together and that this is such an important issue and I'm honored and I feel so privileged to be um, able to take the benefit of your insights and your um, input today on this very, very important issue, especially for an urban city such as Los Angeles. So I'm very excited to be here and to be with all of you. Um, I'm Chris Chabak, um, and I'm the moderator who's lucky enough to be moderate, moderating this panel. And before I start, um, for those of you who are practicing attorneys, there is an MCLE credit for this course. Uh, please, there is an MCLE station next to the uh, next to the registration booth where you should uh, log in and get your MCLE uh, certificate so you can get your MCLE credit for today. And for those of you who are still in law school, you don't have to worry about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but you will, and you'll soon understand yeah. why we're also happy about that part of this. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so today we're here to talk about um, hunger and homelessness and the systematic oppres oppression and um, interconnected issues that impact this very, very real problem that our city faces. Um, and I would love to hear this group speak a little bit about the, the current uh, situation with the magnitude as well as the specific challenges that we have in the city and, and, and in other cities as well. And also to discuss the interconnected issues and the policies that have led us to sort of where we are. And of course, last but not least, to discuss um, some solutions and both real and proposed but red herring solutions that are not really going to um, make a real impact for the, for the challenges that we have ahead of us. So with that, maybe I can ask each of the panelists to speak a little bit about the work that your organization is specifically doing and targeting to address this issue. Um, and we'll start with you, Dorothy. Hi, hello. Uh, I can't think of anything nicer than sitting in a classroom at UCLA Law School and see nothing but women. <laughs> <laughs> really, because I can tell you that uh, when I was here over 45 years ago, uh, there weren't many of us. And it's, it's, it's a very important change. And I, I have the confidence uh, that the change 
will make an impact on every aspect of our lives, especially perhaps the one we want to talk about today. Um, I, I think it was Simone de Beauvoir. Who hasn't heard of Simone de Beauvoir in this room? <laughs> Come on, be honest. Have you all heard of her? Yes. All heard of her. Okay. Then she knows, you know that she's one of our, our heroines, <laughs> our shiro. And she said that a life without compassion and indignation is not worth living. That those are the two things you have to live with. And it's my belief that the fact that this society has lost both of those in great measure, that we are facing this kind of crisis. We should all be embarrassed to live in this city. We should be embarrassed to sit here and have to talk about the solutions to homelessness because it is a shame on us all that we live in a city where we allowed this to happen. How did this happen? How do human beings living in a community allow their fellow citizens to fall into such despair and dereliction that they are sleeping on the street? What, what kind of a society is that? That is a failed society. Now, I know that at the end of this panel, uh, we're supposed to get very positive and <laughs> <laughs> offer solutions. So I was going to get Come. bad stuff. <laughs> um, you, you are the hope of the future, and I have not abandoned hope. But it's difficult these days. And, and I think, I'm, I'm a lawyer in private practice, still practicing, as people <laughs> always say to me, Dorothy, are you still practicing? <laughs> and I have finally come up with an answer. I said, yeah, I'm trying to get it right. <laughs> um, but I have been very much involved for about 25 years in an organization that many of you must know about called the Inner City Law Center. It is the premier public interest law firm in the city of Los Angeles that focuses on homelessness and housing. And I got involved, as I said, about 25 years ago. I went on the board and I'm still there. I was president for a few years. And I got very involved in doing the litigation uh, that at that time was the main litigation that the center did. And that was around slum lords. That was around slum housing and it was about questions of habitability. And we had many, many derelict houses in Los Angeles, some of them old tenements that were built around 1910. Uh, they were very elegant buildings in those years, and they still had the bones. But they had fallen into dereliction, and the landlords were people who just came in, collected the rent, and never wanted to spend a dime on the buildings. And the buildings fell into terrible disrepair. And they were subject to housing uh, fines and, and notices, which they ignored. And what we did was to sue these landlords to bring the housing up to code, to make improvements, to maintain services, and what I saw for the first time in my life were conditions that rivaled those of Calcutta. You had people living in hovels, although there was a roof over the building. You had cockroaches calling into the ears of children while they slept. You had mice gnawing on, we had one family whose child needed oxygen when she slept and the mice would gnaw through the, the wires. Um, we had landlords who took out the windows and never replaced them. We had buildings that had elevators that never worked, that were five and six stories high, with people with disabilities living on the top floor and having to be carried up and down. The conditions were beyond belief, but you know what? These people had a roof over their head. You know, the word home is one of the most precious words in the language, isn't it? 
all the cliches, there's no place like home, home is where the heart is. There's nothing like home. And to be without a home is horrifying, terrifying, sad, unthinkable. And that's what these people were facing when the great, what do they call it, urban renewal occurred in Los Angeles, gentrification. All that means is that our inventory of low-cost housing in Los Angeles was destroyed systematically so that the people who were living in the kind of housing I was fighting to get into shape and being frequently quite successful, their housing was being bought up by big national conglomerates and knocked down and being replaced with those big condo towers on 8th Street and all over downtown for all the yuppies who don't want to commute, filled with expensive condominiums in a city that has no rent control laws that work, no requirement that every building that's built has a percentage of low-cost housing. And when people like my clients in the old days are pushed out of their homes, they become homeless. They don't have credit cards. A lot of them are illegal. They don't have first and last month's rent. They can't get money from a bank. They can't even get a bank account. And there was no place for them to move. There weren't other derelict housing in which they could move. I just represented a group of people whose house was on 19th and Los Angeles Street way down south, and that building was knocked down by a national developer. They're building dormitories for SC. Nope. In this society, there's nothing you can do about that, right? Private property, you buy a building, you're allowed to knock it down. And that process is how we are facing this problem today. And the most important thing that I can tell you about homelessness and how we have got to address it is that most of the solutions being proffered by politicians, even by some do-gooders, are wrong. <laughs> they are not the right solutions. They are band-aids because they don't address the real problem. And the real problem is that this society has to recognize that those are our fellow citizens. We cannot allow them to live like that. And you know what? It means we are going to have to change. We are going to have to give, give something up. And instead, we have this nimbyism growing all over the valley and West LA. Get, get them out of my face, but, not, but don't put them near me. And what's going on is the building of shelters in the West Valley and the, the Northwest Valley. That's not a solution for homelessness. Those are not homes. They remind me of Manzanar, those places. No schools, no places to buy groceries, no family support. They're just putting these people away where no one else can be offended by them. That is not the solution. The solution is we've got to change our heads and acknowledge that homelessness is not a monolith. It's not one problem. It's many problems. And homeless people are not a monolith. There are many kinds of people. A lot of them are people like my clients, hardworking families who become homeless because there's no place for them to live in Los Angeles. And we've got to look at different solutions, separate solutions, for each group of people who have fallen into this terrible, tragic situation. And we're going to figure that out. <laughs> There's an amazing curve between where we, where we started, which is this is terrible, to the end, which is we're going to tell you how to solve it. Um, <laughs> obviously, we're not going to do that. Um, so my name is Shayla. I'm a senior attorney at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Um, Dorothea says, fighting words. Inner City is an amazing organization, as is the Legal Aid Foundation, as is Public Council and Western Center. There are amazing groups in Los Angeles who are doing really um, significant work on this issue. Um, so I, just, I have to say that like my organization just insists I say such things. Um, so I work on the 
primarily on the criminalization of homelessness. Um, I'm really, really lucky I get to do that work at the intersection of housing attorneys who are fighting to keep people housed, um, community economic development folks who are working to build housing, and my role is to work to ensure that the folks who are caught um, who, have, who have fallen through the cracks of decades of failed policies, um, are, their rights are protected in the space between um, when they get evicted and when hopefully they'll move out of homelessness. Um, because unfortunately the city of Los Angeles has for decades um, relied on the assumption that if you do not see homelessness, then you will not care about homelessness. Um, just to level set for all of us, there are 70,000 people on the streets and in shelters in LA County um, who do not have homes. 70,000 people. Um, but that is the tip of the iceberg for the problem in, in, in Los Angeles County because we actually have 550,000 too few affordable units for who needs them in Los Angeles County. Um, which means that, as Dorothea pointed out, it means that when people fall out of, when they're evicted from, um, the unit that they can afford because of our terrible rent control laws, um, because they're just hanging on, that means they're really unlikely to find a place to live, um, and they are likely to cycle into homelessness. It also means that for the 70,000 people who are on the streets of Los Angeles and in shelters, um, they are not there because they want to be. And I think it's, it's really, I find it really demoralizing that we are in a place where we have to say people who are in, unsheltered in Los Angeles are not there because they want to be, but that is where we are in Los Angeles in terms of the conversations that we are having. Um, the reality is that we have too few affordable units, we have too few options to solve the problem, and the reality is that's the result of decades of policy decisions that have gotten us to this place. Right? And you do not have to construct a society that does not have enough affordable units for the people who, do, who need them. You do not have to construct a housing system that allows for corporate ownership, that allows for massive displacement, that allows for the types of segregation that has existed in the city that makes dis the, the weight of homelessness disproportionately felt. Um, by black folks in this community, disproportionately increasing amongst the Latino communities in Los Angeles. Like, these are policy decisions that have been made in Los Angeles and in California and in the United States for decades. So my work in the space of lots of folks who are doing this work is focused on the policy decisions today that are being made um, that criminalize um, that banish people who are experiencing homelessness. So when we talk about criminalization, what we're talking about is laws that make it illegal for unhoused folks to exist and to do the things in life you have to do, but because there isn't enough housing, they're forced to do it in public. That means sleeping, that means eating, that means finding food, that means building shelter. Um, the reality is cities who don't want to deal with massive wealth inequality, that do not want to deal with structural racism that got us here, that do not want to deal with the reality that you cannot allow every ounce of profit to be pulled from land and still have people in houses versus for communities that don't want to deal with that, they inevitably turn to laws that erase the visible signs of homelessness. Right? So in Los Angeles, that means conducting encampment cleanups and throwing away tents. It means barring people from being in places that are visible. Right? Um, it means pushing people to the margins and to invisible because, again, as you started, if you don't see it, you don't care. Right? Um, so that's the work that I do, but I work, um, like I said, luckily, um, at a legal services organization that has one of the housing, one of the largest housing um, units in Los Angeles, where people are fighting about evictions constantly. Um, remind me to make my plug about why all of you, <laughs> bright-eyed <laughs> students, should think about um, the ways in which housing justice is social justice, um, and think about considering joining the ranks of all of us uh, doing this work because there's a ton of amazing work. Um, right now for housing justice attorneys to, to focus their energy and work um, when you graduate, when you have to start caring about MCLEs. It's great. It's fantastic. Um, I have 
I follow Dorothy and Shayla. Um, <laughs> well, to, to talk a little bit about, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Western Center's work. Um, so, uh, Western Center is a nonprofit organization that works statewide. Um, and we work with, one, our, one of our primary responsibilities is working with local legal services providers like Legal Aid Foundation, like Inner City Law Center, like Public Council, and Beth Zedek and many others um, um, across the state, um, providing, uh, providing like a place to, for advocates to convene on the, the different areas that we work in. Um, currently we work in the areas of housing, um, in, uh, in health and as well as in public benefits um, and financial, public benefits slash financial security. Um, and we've been working on behalf of low income Californians statewide for over 50 years and do that through legislative advocacy uh, as well as litigation and um, administrative advocacy and providing the technical assistance and support to local legal services providers. Um, so because a big part of our work is, um, is in the legislature, uh, we've been able to advocate for, the, um, for, for policies that directly and indirectly impact the issues of, of hunger and homelessness. Um, so for example, we um, have uh, gotten some momentum on, on, on trying to end hunger for college students. So, you know, we talked about the, the homelessness, if uh, Dorothy mentioned earlier, homelessness is, is not a monolith, right? It impacts so many different, you can, so many different, once you start disaggregating the data, so many different elements of our society. And so, um, you know, something that you may have noticed in the news or just from your experience of being in higher education is that there are just um, an, an enormous and overwhelming amount of students who experience hunger and who experience housing insecurity, right? And so um, tr to try to be at the forefront of these policies, we've been working um, at the national level to try to get um, legislation to end college hunger, meaning um, allowing um, one of the initiatives is to try to get um, college, uh, college students the ability to use um, SNAP or CalFresh benefits, which are what people commonly refer to as food stamps, which actually isn't um, possible for most folks um, at the moment. Um, and we've also done litigation around theft of, of public benefits um, for low-income Californians. So, um, where people actually have had their, like the way that the um, CalFresh works is through electronic benefits now, you get a card, and so those card like you're susceptible to, 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 you know, electronic theft, and people were actually bearing the brunt of losing their benefits through this electronic, like it's just awful, the ways in which, um, you know, poor people are frankly screwed, <laughs> you know, oftentimes by, People who will prey on them, um, and so um, you know we've fought or we've we've handled litigation to um, to try to get benefits back for individuals who have experienced this harm, and also have worked on legislation um, that is now I think pending before the governor um, <laughs> to get, um, get you know, to codify um, the 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 rights that we um, affirmed in that lawsuit. And so that's SB 1140, if anyone wants to quickly write to the governor again. Or see if he's in the past hour. Or see if he's in the past hour, which would be a shame. Um, and so, of course, homelessness interacts with our various issue areas at Western Center. Um, most directly, we recently litigated a case um, in called Warren versus City of Chico um, with Legal Services of Northern California, really building upon the amazing foundational work that Shayla has done in LA, um, challenging anti, an anti-camping ordinance in the city of Chico that essentially drove unhoused people outside of the city limits because they, um, or, or they would face um, basically interactions with law enforcement, um, removal by law enforcement, and the settlement actually in, um, included getting dedicated shelter sites for unhoused people. But litigation is, you know, one tool that we use, but the, the what we really need to do is think more broadly about how we, um, how we really challenge these practices. So, you know, as I said, we work in the legislature. One thing that um, 
we've we've done is um, really try to monitor and advance opportunities for people who are unhoused to um, to to get housing to by by doing budget advocacy, getting more funding for affordable housing. Affordable housing has been um, a, a, a when we talk about lo, uh, a local, state, and federal policy failure, it's definitely in the provision of affordable housing, right? Um, since the 70s, there's been mass disinvestment in public housing. There is still public housing. You can actually go visit public housing here in Los Angeles that is, um, uh, you know, that, that still exists, but it's so, so massively disinvested that you know, there's no construction of new public housing. Um, there's been a transition to invest, like creating affordable housing through public-private partnerships, primarily through the low-income housing tax credit program, which is a federal program administered by states and by some localities. Um, that has, well, although that has produced probably the, uh, you know, not an insignificant amount of affordable housing. There's been, you know, a huge. There's been problems with making sure to target more deeply, creating more deeply affordable units because we have folks who are not only low income, we have people who are very low income and extremely low income who lack housing opportunities, right? And so, and that, and that public-private partnership does nowhere near the kind of lifting on affordable housing that we need. Um, Sheila mentioned how much affordable housing deficit we have in, um, in LA, we have, uh, actually a million units, uh, a million affordable, like, we need a million affordable units in California for extremely low income people, and that's people who, um, who, who make 30% of the area median income or less, um, and that's not even including people who are defined as very low income who make 50% of the area median income or people who are low income who make 80% of the area median income. So I mean, that's the kind of crisis that we're dealing with. And the most visible um, result of that crisis is being, seeing people who are experiencing homelessness. Now, we talked about how, um, about narratives, I think, um, earlier. One thing that we really need to think about is, uh, oftentimes it's, it's a very tempting narrative to talk about homelessness as a Personal failing, um, or you know, or moral failing, um, you know, often with a focus on people who are experiencing mental health crises or people who are, um, you know, you, uh, using substances, um, or you know, basically there's this whole thing about drug use among the uh, population of people experiencing homelessness. But that is a cop out. What we're doing when we when we look at seventy thousand people who are experiencing homelessness on a given night in Los Angeles. What we're looking at is a, is a systemic crisis and one that deserves systemic solutions and not pointing at people and saying, you know what, you're the pop cause of your own problems. So I'll pause there because I feel like I veered off significantly from the, the initial prompt of the question. I, I, we, we, you're just ahead of us. <laughs> These are all the topics to be covered. Yeah. Um, I, in, in talking with the panelists earlier this week, I learned something that I wasn't previously aware of. Um, Dorothy brought to my attention that over a hundred million dollars, uh, was it 180? 150. 150. 150 million dollars were returned by the city of Los Angeles to the housing and urban development because the, the money was supposed to be allocated towards solving the homelessness situation, the, the challenge in, in the city, and they couldn't spend it. And they had to be returned to the federal government. So I would love to hear your thoughts on why isn't just simply building more affordable units with funding or, or, or additional revenues, why isn't that enough of a solution? What, what other interconnected policy concerns and considerations that should we be looking at as well? Well, to be very simplistic, the, the main reason is greed. Um, as far as that money is concerned, and I think it's a very important aspect because we, we do want to get to the question of what the next generation is going to do about this and how you're going to fix it. Uh, and there are systemic issues that have nothing to do with the more profound issues of loss of community and loss of a sense of citizenship and loss of compassion. And that is that we have not put in place in our city or county structures that know how to deal with anything that they 
are doing. It, it, it's shocking beyond belief. The $150 million, $150 million that was given to our politicians from, by HUD to begin to ameliorate these problems, they couldn't figure out how to spend it. They couldn't figure out a structure to allocate it. They couldn't figure out the projects that were in place or that needed to be developed to put this money to use. Now, is that not unbelievably shocking and astonishing? A few years ago, you may remember, we passed a proposition, Triple H it was called. We passed that proposition. The state gave us $50 million. That's still sitting in a box in City Hall. You know why? Because in their great wisdom, our politicians decided to make a commission on homelessness to figure out how to spend this money that we needed so much. $50 million. Doesn't sound like as much as it used to, but it was a lot of money. He appointed, they appointed a commission of 50, 50 people representing every point of view, every community, every interest. Can you imagine how many decisions a commission of 50 people made? Okay. So the first attack on the problem of homelessness is structure and its political action. And to the extent that homelessness is not a monolithic problem, you've got to unpack it and say, what do we need to solve this problem in which place, in this place, in that place? Legislation is a tremendous place to do that. Just in the paper this morning, there's a, an article about a state uh, bill that's pending that will uh, impose an additional very tiny tax on people who make over $2 million a year, and that fund will go to solving problems of, around homelessness. Can you imagine the money that's going to be spent to oppose that piece of legislation? So as with many of our problems, voting is still the answer. I mean, we haven't got any opinions out of the new Supreme Court yet this term, so we can still have hope for our democracy. And uh, the way to protest these issues is to unpack them and say, what do we have to do? What are the structures we need? Where should this money be allocated? We're not going to solve all the problems at once. We're not probably going to solve any of them totally, but we can make an impact. And when you have things like this money being unused and bureaucrats who just stymie the process and legislators who are afraid of the political ramifications of their action and developers who have the ears of the legislators, you're going to be up against a lot of opposition. So you've got to be politically active. You've got to tell your congressmen. You've got to tell your assemblymen. You've got to tell your city council person. Small action. Take this small action. Shelters are not the answer. Housing is the answer. You put people in housing, give them a home, give them a place where they are safe and have a roof over their head and the head, children's head. And then you can begin to figure out what they need. A lot of them just need the house. They're people like my former clients. They'll go on with their jobs. Families who have two and three jobs and two and three kids and they're, they're doing okay. They're not great, but they're surviving people who are mentally incapacitated, then you find them the services. But you've got to look at the structure. You've got to figure out why this bureaucracy is so stymied that it can't even begin to figure out how to spend money, spend money that someone's given them. And I, I think from my, pers from my perspective, um, you know, I, the story about the $150 million, I think, is like indicative of something really significant that's happening in Los Angeles, which is we look at $150 million and we say we couldn't spend it. Um, and I think oftentimes we stop having a conversation, which is about why we couldn't spend it, right? And I think the reality about that $150 million is that couldn't get spent because there aren't enough um, private landlords that are willing to house unhoused folks and take those vouchers, right? It was about sending vouchers back. Um, and I think politicians want to say, give us more vouchers, give us more vouchers, we need more federal funding. 
actually, no, we need to like structurally break it all down and build it back up. And that takes into account wealth inequality, systemic racism, all of the issues that we're talking about because Los Angeles is getting $150 million they can't spend because they're not fixing the structural problems that got us here in the first place, right? Um, I think the way that we tend to talk about homelessness separate and apart from housing is endemic to this problem, right? We, t we tend to bifurcate these two, these two issues. And so we talk, about, um, we talk about how to solve the homelessness crisis, and we almost never talk about how to fix the housing crisis that, that Nisha talked about, right, that, that is going That's on. That's the crisis. Um, like, we're not, we're not going to solve homelessness in Los Angeles until we fundamentally restructure our understanding about what it means for everybody to be inside. And we're never structurally going to solve this problem unless we understand that wealth inequality is driving that problem. And we have a deep an unabiding commitment to wealth inequality in this city. We just do, right? Um, I, when I think about the criminalization of homelessness, I think about it within the context of a big lie, right? This idea that you create a lie that makes, that people want to believe in, because if they believe in the big lie, then it makes everything else okay, right? So in Los Angeles, we have constructed a very big lie, which is, that homelessness is about personal choice, um, that um, people who are unhoused are doing something wrong, and um, that allows us to criminalize homelessness. Um, people are unhoused because they just can't find the right door, right? People are unhoused because they can't find the right landlord, right? Um, and that big lie is like definitional to living in Los Angeles um, because it's the lie that means it's okay for me to go home and for my neighbor not to, right? Like it's sort of a thing that we've accepted to be okay to live in a city with 70,000 people who are unhoused um, and property values to skyrocket, right? Like if you own a home in Los Angeles and you bought anywhere five years from now or before, you are financially benefiting from a system that created the homelessness crisis. Right? This is not about like individual choices because corporations are benefiting from it far more than individual homeowners, but we are, by accepting these big lies, we're giving permission for a society so predicated on wealth and equality to continue to exist. Um, so for me, it's about, like, if we're going to talk about $150 million, I want to have a serious conversation about why it is that there's $150 million that are ser that's left on the table. And the politicians not only are sending the money back, but they have done nothing to change the structure that means that there's not enough landlords to rent when the rent is paid for by the federal government. Yeah. I, I'm like, cosign. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, I, I think, you know, just, just on this, this um, issue of vouchers, um, vouchers are often kind of heralded as like the magic key to all of this, but as you have just heard, we can't even get people to accept them. Even though the state in 2019 passed a law that included in the definition of source of income discrimination that is prohibited under the California Fair Employment and Housing Act, they included um, having a voucher as you know, source of income, which meant that effectively source of income discrimination includes vouchers and you cannot discriminate against people because they're gonna pay all or part of their rent through a voucher. Um, but that is, you know, that's something that is not, still not gonna fix the problem because there's so many ways in which, like that's relying on enforcement, primarily private enforcement, um, that is relying on um, basically a sea change with um, landlords. And I think like really at the end of the day, thinking about the private market as the solution to our housing crisis, our affordable housing crisis, is one that we really need to deeply examine. Um, this is, you know, and I think like, you know, one thing that I was hopeful for if, if, if that, I don't know, that's a terrible, 
thing to say, but like with the pandemic, I thought, okay, maybe there's an opportunity here to rethink income inequality. Maybe there's an opportunity here to rethink how we're doing things because things were already so broken and the pandemic came and really broke them, right? And so um, in trying to get policies to try to keep people in their homes and all of us fighting for all sorts of different things to really um, respond to the pandemic and respond to the fallout from the pandemic for especially for low income people, what we found was that you know maybe there was some room. And I'm, I'm a little less hopeful now about that. There's not as much, I mean, there's, there's some bright spots, but really, you know, we could think about at this stage, what are some other solutions? What are some other investments that we can make as a society that don't rely on private landlords taking vouchers, for example? So I'll pause there. I, we, we did promise you that we were going to end in that high note. <laughs> so if not vouchers, if not $150 million, <laughs> what, how, what, what are the things that we as a community, what we can do from a policy standpoint to even incrementally move in the right direction? And, and of course, questions are also welcome, so. If you prefer us to answer a different question. <laughs> 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 I'm like, I have a question, I guess, about um, like one solution. So I guess like actually just like context, because this is like a, uh, directly like related to some work I'm hoping to do is I'm applying for like public interest fellowships right now. I'm a 3L student um, and my project right now that I've proposed is developed around the affirmatively furthering fair housing bill, um, <laughs> AFFH duty. And so, um, I just wanted to hear what your thoughts were on AFFH. I would specifically actually be working with Leadership Council in the uh, San Joaquin Valley, so rural community instead of urban, so I just didn't know if also, I, I mean, on a statewide level for Western poverty too, if just anybody had thoughts on if AFFH could actually be like helpful considerations moving forward and if like a rural setting versus a urban setting is a different uh, beast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So so just to, for folks who don't, aren't aware, um, there is a mandate in the Federal Fair Housing Act that any uh, recipient of funds from HUD um, and the government itself uh, do what's called affirmatively further fair housing. So their obligation doesn't just stop at stopping discrimination uh, like or saying like, oh, this is this kind of discrimination is prohibited by landlords, it's also examining and taking meaningful actions to that taken together um, result in changing our segregated landscape and also like creating more housing opportunity or uh, community opportunities really for um, people who have been, you know, uh, uh, the the basically the victims of discrimination and, and segregation and um, racial um, uh, you know, hierarchies, right? And so, um, and the idea is, and then also um, there is an element of that is to also create protections for people who are impacted by displacement. Um, there's, it's, it, it's pretty expansive, the, the concept, um, and it has been embedded, the concept has been embedded in state law. And so, um, as I won't get into all of the details about how that happened, but a, a lot of it had to do with the Trump administration and whatever. But anyway, the state um, did did create a mandate to affirmatively further fair housing for all state agencies, as well as create that duty for all local jurisdictions, and they actually have to respond to that in their what's their called their housing element. It's a document it sounds really wonky but it's actually really important so it's really to wonky too though yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so the the housing element um is a eight there's an essentially an eight-year planning process for jurisdictions to plan for all of their projected housing needs and it's a whole like regional and statewide like process anyway so um this but that's not important that's what's important is that it creates a hook then for um you know for, for holding jurisdictions accountable for their actions, right? 
And so there's a lot of really great discussions, um, including with Leadership Council, about how to use affirmatively furthering fair housing, how to use that mandate in a way to um, protect people from criminalization, from you know who are people who are unhoused. Um, also, how to create um, environmental justice leverage, and I think you know I don't. I think that there it will look different, perhaps in rural communities and more urban communities, um, with the specific policies and practices. But I think that it is, it is a an important place to develop a, a really uh, um, it's an important place for us to develop this this accountability tool. And there's a lot. I'm very excited about your project. Let's talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> Can but, I? Yeah. Oh. yeah. I think we have one more question. Okay. I do have a question. Um, I'm a land use attorney and I represent mostly private developers and um, I'm fortunate to work on a lot of affordable housing projects, which I'm really happy about and excited about. But on my end of things where I'm, you know, kind of in the weeds on entitlements and CEQA and all of that, it's so frustrating for me because we just can't get these projects approved, even ones that like I'm working on one right now that is approved, has funding, but we're having issues with LAHD and the rent schedules and all of that. So I'm just really curious about what what solutions are there. I mean, I, I, you talked a lot about like big systemic ones, which I completely agree with, but I'm just so curious about what we can do, because there's obviously a big problem. Well, I, I think again that legend, you know, political activism is very important in that area, because for example, I think today there's an article in the paper about a new law, uh, which I think Newsom has signed, which has uh, withdrawn a lot of the impediments for building multiple uh, residential housing in areas where it wasn't allowed before. You know, one, one of the things that we have protected so vigorously in California is our spread out lifestyle and uh, single family houses and lots of space because we had all this space once. And uh, the notion that we've got to build up if we want to be an urban society and the impediments to building up have been very great, legis you know, statutory. So I think that's an area where there's finally some pressure being put that's going to be successful. And if you could build housing, residential housing, in a lot of the empty spaces all over the place, uh, you could begin to alleviate that crisis. Now, un unhappily, I suspect that even when those impediments are removed, a lot of the housing will probably be middle, middle class or upper class housing to begin with, because that's where the developers will rush in and be thrilled that they can finally build residence in commercial areas. But that, that's a very important development legislative. Why, this is why I think that you know, there are two ways to begin to solve this problem. One is to really wake people up and change their hearts and their minds and make them remember that they are citizens of a community and that we're all human beings and that we have to care for each other. Uh, and the fact that we're able um, to ignore our fellow citizens is something we have to get over. Uh, but the other way is, is the political action, because I think it's time for legislation in the collateral areas of rent control and rent, uh, you know, uh, zoning, uh, things like that, which will allow there to actually be an increase in the stock of housing generally. And if that could be married to strong rent control, or the requirement of low-cost housing in every project, you could really begin to make a dent, I think. So I think we're actually out of time. Oh. But Sheila, I think you had a feedback to... Oh, I just wanted to, I, because I said I was going to come back to the pitch about housing justice and about it being sort of like a, a path forward, I think. How many of you were law students? Love it. Love to see it. Thank you for spending your Friday with us. Um, I think oftentimes at UCLA, this is, there is an amazing um, commitment to public interest. There's an amazing commitment to critical race theory, um, and at the at the center of those in Los Angeles is housing justice, right? Housing justice and the fight to bring people inside is the fight against racial segregation that has built this city, 
right? It's the fight against mass incarceration that has disproportionately meant that black and brown folks are on the streets and every time we look at this. Mass incarceration is also the narrative that gets us to say it's okay to make populations invisible by throwing their stuff away and throwing them in jail rather than building housing. Like, I came to this work coming from UCLA, like coming from the strong history and moving into housing, moving into like a generalist practice and realizing that if, like, if I was gonna talk um, about the issues facing queer and trans folks in, Ho in Hollywood, I was gonna talk about homelessness and I was gonna talk about housing because those are the issues that people are facing. Um, and there is such an amazing movement right now in Los Angeles that is like twofold. It is amazing organizing happening around these issues um, where people are standing up and they're saying like, not in my city. Right, and it is phenomenal to watch. I get to I get, sometimes I get to be their lawyer. Like I'm the lawyer for an amazing organization at Skid Row, um, where we fight these issues. Um, so there's amazing organizing going on, and at the same time, there is a recognition that tenants deserve lawyers to go through a, a process to evict people. Right, that evicting people from their homes is, as Dorothy said, like devastating. Right, and when you allow people to be evicted from their homes without representation, you're doing more than just stripping them of their homes. You are stripping the legitimacy of the process that strips them of their homes, right? So there is a phenomenal thing happening in Los Angeles right now to combat this, to build power. And lawyers who are coming out of law school are um, have an amazing opportunity. It's both like a place for like great jobs we are hiring a lot of people yeah. at Laughlin and inner city and everywhere else. Um, but it's also a way to think about the ways in which like representing tenants is also about building power, right? It's also about like breaking down the systems that are causing this crisis. And like every time a tenant has a lawyer, they are like taking a step to say no. Like the systems and greed and wealth inequality that built this city cannot sustain. So like I would just encourage all of you, if you're thinking about what you're doing next and you are thinking about how to take this amazing, like amazing work that you're doing in, in CRS and public interest and all of the stuff that got you here to this panel on a Friday because it's good for you. Um, like talk to us. Get engaged, get involved, think about coming to work for our organizations, think about being part of that movement. Um, take Nisha's class. Yeah, take my class. <laughs> because you came here on a Friday, um, I know you want to take a J-term class. And that J-term class is LA Housing Law and Policy um, with myself and my co-instructor, Diana Prado, who's an amazing tenants attorney in Los Angeles. So You're the best. <laughs> so... I like and the inner stress. city law center has internships <laughs> for law students. We have people from UCLA law school. Oh, good pitch. We're always hiring summer law clerks. You can come work with me. You can come. You can watch depositions of law enforcement officers who threw away homeless people's property. I think the, so the, the, we're out of time. <laughs> I, could, I could listen to these amazing ladies all day.